Are you suffering from pain or tingling in your hand that's exacerbated with activities such as typing? Hey everyone, this is Dr. Zach Quid here, Performance Sport and Spine, and in today's video we'll be discussing carpal tunnel syndrome. The carpal tunnel is located in your wrist, and one side is made up of tendons, and then the other side is comprised of the transverse carpal ligament. This condition is estimated to affect about 4-5% to of people worldwide, and it's most common in people in their 40s to 60s, and females seem to be more likely to have this condition than males. At this point, please like our video and subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to turn on notifications. So what does this condition feel like? Well, it's typically characterized by pain or tingling in the hand. More specifically, the thumb, index, and middle finger, and the radial side or the thumb side of the ring finger. People also may report loss of grip strength, unresponsiveness, an itchy feeling, or some sort of dexterity issue. So maybe you start dropping stuff or you're just more clumsy with that hand. There can be mild, moderate, or severe cases. In that median nerve distribution, there's different anatomical variations. So your symptoms may be a little different than the ones I just talked about, and that's normal. So what's causing little tingling fingers to happen? Well, most of the time, it's kind of this mechanical pressure that presses on the nerve which causes lack of oxygen, and then over time the nerve can get irritated and start to die. A couple important things to note is that this is not an inflammatory condition as a primary driver, which is why NSAIDs rarely help. And then secondly, it's more than just the nerve getting pinched. There's other factors to consider, such as genetics, diabetes, size of the carpal tunnel, so we'll discuss this more in detail later. So for example, when your wrist is in neutral, the pressure inside that carpal tunnel is between two and 10 milligrams of mercury, or MMHG. When your wrist is fully extended, it can be 10 times that. And when your wrist is fully flexed, it can be eight times that. And again, it's not that these positions are inherently bad. You should always be able to flex and extend your wrist. You just can't do it excessively. And it becomes problematic when you do it for eight hours a day, five days a week for many years. Listen, this condition can be extremely frustrating. And a helpful thing that we can do is find our current baseline for tolerance of activities. So let's say for instance, you know that after 40 minutes of typing, your symptoms are gonna get worse. Set your alarm for 35 or 38 minutes. And when it goes off, get up and shake your hand, move around, get a coffee. And this helps prevent the symptoms from starting, sit down, and then reset your alarm. And this can be very helpful for managing this condition. Now we'll start the exercise and rehabilitation portion of this video. Now arguably, a lot of exercises will be helpful for this condition and just modify them a little bit. So again, if you're doing something like push-ups with your wrist extended, maybe just grab a dumbbell and do it that way. So again, stay active, but just change things a little bit. So the first exercise is the wrist mobilization. So in a standing or seated position with your elbows straight, you're gonna bend your wrist down towards the floor and tilt your head towards that wrist simultaneously, and then bring your wrist up towards the ceiling and tilt your head away. Start with a slow range of motion and increase over time. Wrist and elbow mobilization. In a standing or seated position, have your elbow bent at 90. Slowly but controlled, straighten your elbow and extend your wrist down towards the floor, simultaneously tilting your head to that side. From there, flex your wrist up towards the ceiling and bring your elbow back into that flex or bent position, tilting your head away. Start with a slow range of motion and increase over time. Seated thoracic extension. In a seated position, place your hands behind your neck. Focus on your upper back or the part of the spine between your shoulder blades. Arch or extend that portion up, straighten your head. Hold for a few seconds and then relax and then repeat. So with your hand facing the ceiling, you're going to bend your fingers, make a fist, straighten your fingers, and then return to the starting position. Again, we're gonna hook our fingers make a fist, straighten our fingers out, and then return to the starting position. Sideline thoracic rotation. So laying on your side, bring your top leg up to a 90-90 position. Take the top arm straight to the ceiling and then gently rotate your upper back, the arm back behind you towards the floor. Again, start with a slight range of motion and increase over time. In addition, wearing a splint both during the day and at night has seemed to be a helpful adjunct to help manage this condition. So surgery, is it needed? Well, it turns out research shows that about 80% will see improvement from this procedure. Unfortunately, also 80% will probably see symptoms reoccur with one year, and about 8% actually see the symptoms get worse. The most common procedure is a carpal tunnel release procedure, 
And it's important to note that mild to moderate cases should only be surgically managed after failed conservative care of two to three months. So our three stages are again, mild to moderate severe. Not everyone's gonna present the same. So stage one or mild. Typically people wake up from sleep with numbness or swelling of the hand. There may also be moderate to severe pain, but often just shaking your hand will relieve the symptom. Stage two or moderate. This is where symptoms start to appear during the day with physically repetitive activities or extended specific positions. People also may find that their hand starts to be clumsy or they have trouble gripping objects. Stage three, this is where there starts to be atrophy of the thinner eminence or the thumb muscles and people also may experience sensory deficits. Some predictors for better outcomes are one, if the person's younger age, two, if the symptoms haven't been around for very long, three, if the symptoms are on one side or unilateral, and then fourth, there's a negative phalanx test, which is an orthopedic test to test the nerve at the wrist. Risk factors for this condition. And again, it's multifactorial and it's more than just mechanical pressure on that nerve. Obesity, pregnancy, genetic heritability, diabetes, a smaller carpal tunnel size, rheumatoid arthritis, smoking, alcoholism, and then fractures of the wrist, especially the distal radial head. There are other conditions that can present somewhat similarly that need to be ruled out. So the first is carpal metacarpal arthritis of the thumb. This typically is excruciating pain with thumb movement. There's a positive grind evaluation and there'll be positive findings on x-rays or films. Cervical radiculopathy. So this would have neck pain, worse with movement, numbness on the thumb and index finger, and then a positive Sperling's test, which is compression of the cervical disc in the neck. The quare veins, where this would have tenderness over the distal radial Thank you for watching our video on carpal tunnel syndrome. We hope this brought this light to this frustrating condition. If you did find this video helpful, please like it and subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to check out our other videos.